notes. They're not meant uh, for you to read. You can get the content out of the book. So if you want to read it, read it. You should read it. All right. So I wasn't going to panopula it, but if we are going to record it, panopula could be useful, maybe. I absolutely love recording this. I know several of us go back and re-listen. So even though I read it, there is value to it. All right, let me start this then. Okay. Okay, get that recording there. Let me get rid of this. Oh, that's us. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so you guys can see my stuff there, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank okay, you for so, putting them back up. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, I mean, keeping in mind that uh, not everybody has the same learning style and one person's comments don't necessarily reflect everybody's, but uh, I get that from a few students. So I know at least a good section of you feel that way. Um, either way, I'm happy to adjust and adapt where I can. Um, it's not full of pictures, but uh, we do cover an intense amount of material in a short time and that's not by my doing, that's by the, the the design of the course uh, from before I got here. All right, so we'll start with restrictive cardiomyopathy. Tell me what you know about restrictive cardiomyopathy. What is it and what does it mean? And how do we see it? Um, just basically the heart's not appropriately relaxing. Yes, so fundamentally restrictive physiology, that's what we're talking about. Good. So, how do we see that from a uh, from a diagnostic standpoint, from a quantitative standpoint? Is there less pericardial fluid? Okay, that may be part of it, but how do you determine that it's restrictive versus something else? Mitral valve inflow evaluation and high yep. and diastolic pressures. So remember, restrictive has to do totally with diastolic function. So we got to go back to our diastolic function stuff, which is uh, inflow, mitral valve inflow, that is. Um, I'm doing some measurements on that. We're going to do uh, the Q to the E, Q to the A. We're going to do the E to E prime ratio, the E to A ratio. We're going to do the D cell time, um, A duration. All that stuff gets done uh, as part of your diastolic function stuff. That's mitral inflow. Uh, next level of that is doing Valsalva with that, so a maneuver to be able to change the pressures in the heart to see what that does to the flow and to the hemodynamics. Uh, and then we measure the same, well, we don't have to measure stuff on there, we're simply looking for a reversal of the E and the A. Um, and then next step is to do tissue Doppler. Uh, tissue Doppler, as it becomes worse and worse diastolic function, remember it gets a lower and lower velocity. Uh, these restrictive ones are super low. If you're scanning these in a clinical setting, you're likely down at like four uh, centimeters per second, which is a very low velocity uh, for tissue Doppler. Typically, we're over eight, but it's not uncommon on a normal heart to be between uh, 10 to 20 uh, centimeters per second. So those are the big ones. And then, of course, we have uh, pulmonary venous flow as well. So we're comparing... Um, you know, your A duration, your A velocity, A reversal velocity, uh, as well as my, um, sometimes the S wave and stuff like that as well. So uh, 
but really we're looking at uh, what's happening with those waveforms relative to each other. The biggest one on pulmonary veins is really the, um, the A reversal, it's the duration and its velocity. Um, and then you can stick into that equation also the um, propagation velocity as well. So those are things that sort of contribute to it. And then secondarily on those charts, um, you go back to looking at things like atrial size and things like that, uh, in addition to pressure, which you know relates to the pressures or volume um, in the atria specifically. So basically go back to diastolic function. It's the worst version of diastolic function. We have two phases of restrictive cardiomyopathy. One is reversible, one is irreversible. Okay, but generally speaking, they'll have similar characteristics. Otherwise, it's just that they can't do anything to change um, and, and make it go backwards, so to speak. And Nancy? So is this the, the irreversible? I mean, sorry, is, is this the reversible one? This is both. Okay. Yeah, so, but just keeping in mind that the worse we get, the worse it becomes and it becomes at some point irreversible. This, if somebody's in restrictive physiology, they're typically fairly end stage already. It's just how far end stage are we? Uh, we're definitely past the pseudo normal stage. So when we talk about restrictive, that's really what we're talking about is the diastolic function uh, side of this. Um, so that's kind of the take home message for that. So if I've got diastolic uh, issues, what do you expect to see when I'm looking uh, at the heart chamber size-wise and things like that? What do you think we might be looking at? Normal ventricular size. Yeah, so normal, then, normal chamber size. But hypertrophic. Yes, very thick walls, yeah. So that and combination is there. What do you think the systolic function would be doing? Normal. So systolic function, so it, it's true uh, restricted cardiomyopathy is typically isolated from systolic things. Now, far, far down the road, when the heart finally starts giving up, yes, it's going to have systolic issues also. That's why uh, I call it uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, right? Right, right. Yes. So, yeah, in true restrictive physiology, as we're just in restrictive, it's mainly a diastolic function issue. In the case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's because the muscle thickness is causing the stiffness of the walls uh, and not to be able to relax and have that uh, elastic uh, kind of recoil um, is what we're looking for. So that's kind of your classic uh, presentation of that. Um, again, the uh, typical um, presentation of that is in amyloidosis, and we'll show some pictures of amyloidosis here in a second. Um, but basically, it's a it's an infiltrative type of a state. It has a speckly kind of an appearance uh, to it, um, and there's other things that can mimic that that we'll talk about briefly as well. Um, again, so it's kind of late stages. If if somebody has ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy, uh, that's going to be seen in later stages of it. Uh, but basically the take home message on restrict in restrictive from a 2D perspective is that the, the ventricle size, chamber size is normal, uh, but we have bilateral atrial enlargement. So that, that is an important point uh, to distinguish this from other stuff like, um, like constrictive cardiomyopathy, which we haven't talked about yet, but you have to differentiate between restrictive and constrictive. They're two totally different things. Uh, but by atrial enlargement is attributed to restrictive cardiomyopathy. Oh, so hey, Scott. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So the restrictive or constrictive where the right ventricle collapses doing diastole? That is, uh, that is tamponade specifically, and that has to do with uh, elevated pressures in the pericardial sac. Oh, okay. Constrictive is a different concept. I mean, it might still get uh, tamponade, but tamponade <clears throat> uh, physiology goes uh, because of the elevated pressures outside. Constrictive, just to give you a teaser for it, is basically it's a hardened, um, calcified type of a, a very fibrous type of a pericardial sac, uh, and it does not allow for much uh, expansion. So it's basically what Darren would call a heart in a can. Um, basically, it's got rigid walls. Um, and whatever pressure buildup is in between the heart and that sac, uh, like pericardial effusion, uh, if that pressure increases significantly, then it's going to put uh, 
some major changes on the hemodynamics of the heart itself, and that's what kicks us into tamponade. Tamponade is a, a life-threatening condition where, um, again, it's not something you're scanning and you notice it, and then you just like finish your exam an hour later and then you go give it to the doctor. That's something you want to go talk to. It. Get your evidence immediately uh, for that specifically. That's where you're going to tailor your protocol quickly to do what you need to to go show the doctor, give them the proof. Because if you just go out claiming that there's tamponade and you didn't show any proof, he's going to kick you in the butt, uh, and make you go back and do it again. So get what you need, and then you go show the doctor immediately. Uh, they may have you finish the exam while they um, get things going. They may take the patient straight from there and get them into an emergency uh, surgery or something like that. So <clears throat> again, that's just a taste of what's coming. We're going to talk about that in some more detail, but that's constrictive physiology uh, is when it's the heart and the cane. It's the rigid. Uh, pericardial sac uh, causing uh, pressure from outside the heart um, onto the heart. And that will affect the hemodynamics. But in restrictive physiology, we're talking about diastolic function issues, very, very, very poor diastolic function. Um, again, normal ventricular chambers with large walls, thickened walls, that is, um, uh, pathologic thickening, we'll say, and then um, the biatrial enlargement. And because of biatrial enlargement, what do you think we would also uh, start to concern about? PFO. Okay, it could be PFO, yes. So if we are stretching our chambers, there might be a new shunt reopening. That's correct. What else? Could it be the backup through the uh, pulmonary veins? Yes. And into the lungs? Backup, correct. Thrombus formation. Thrombus formation because of? The stagnant flow. The stagnant flow because of the restrictive LV because of <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep going. <laughs> so anytime we get chamber enlargement, what happens to your electrical signal? Oh, AFib. AFib, yes. Thank you. And so, yeah, so the AFib comes into play. We get stagnation of flow, particularly in the left atrial appendage. Um, and again, if it's in the right heart, you could also get uh, atrial uh, thrombus um, on that free wall with the pectinate muscle as well. Uh, but most commonly, we're, we're concerned about uh, the left atrial appendage, mostly because it's going to the brain. And of course, that would cause strokes. And that's, that's our, uh, aside from a heart attack, that's our next worst uh, fear. Good, 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 good. So we just talked about all that. Um, so again, hallmark of that. So when we're doing the echo, so again, what if I have a restrictive physiology, tell me what we want to see, what we want to prove on echo. What are we going to look at? What are we going to measure? What are we going to do a TV color inspection? So chamber size is important to me. What do I want to see? I don't want to see crickets. So, so we would see yeah, normal ahead, ahead, internal Maria. dimension, but walls is going to be increased in size because of hypertrophy. Yep. So on my echo, I got to show the walls. Okay. What uh, what pictures of the walls are relevant and what measurements are relevant? Plaques. Any picture that shows a wall or a chamber size. Okay, so that's basically, I want to see all the views of the ventricles in particular. I want to measure the ventricle in my peristernal long axis uh, in 2D and in M mode. Uh, we also, um, another place that the dimensions of the ventricle are taken into consideration is our symptom. So even though I'm not looking at systolic function, the diastolic measurement of the symptoms um, gives us some information, right, on chamber side. Um, LV mass index. Okay. So honestly, in an adult lab, it's not done that much, the LV mass index, but in a pediatric lab, that's like, they do it all the time. Okay. Because they want to see the muscle bulk that's there. Uh, so again, it de depends on the lab that you're in. Some might do it, some might not. Um, again, Tammy was telling me that uh, in the pediatric lab, that's, that's like, that's like essential. Okay, whereas an adult lab, you know, Tyler suggested, and, and I would suggest from my experience that adult labs don't do LV mass index very much. It's not a hard measurement, 
but it's something that gives you an idea of how thick the walls are and how much muscle bulk is there. Um, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to measure those. We're going to look at them in 2D. Do we want to see their function as well as uh, just seeing them in a 2D picture? Um, what about the other chambers? Definitely want to look for enlargement of the atria. Okay. So yes, by atrial enlargement is particular. So that means right and left are equally big. Okay. Just like our picture is showing here. Uh, so you can see the size difference we're talking about there. Look how small the LV and RV are compared to the atria. The atria are bigger. Okay, that's that's pretty significant. Remember that the atria are very prone to stretching. Uh, if we can't that get that fluid into the, the ventricle itself, guess where it's going to go? It's going to back up into the atria. Okay. Having said that and seeing what we see here, yes, we're going to expect some electrical abnormalities. We're going to be looking to see if there's any things floating in the atria, but I'm also going to be uh, expecting some other stuff on the valvular level. What do you think we might expect there? Regurgitation. Regurgitation, because we're stretching out the atria and the, and the annulus and stuff like that. So yeah, it's not just um, ventricular enlargement or dilation that causes regurgitation. Anything that's uh, stretching stuff out significantly, as, in, as Kelsey pointed out as well, anytime we get big, big atria, uh, look at the septum, the interatrial septum, and look for the bowing back and forth. But regardless, you're going to be looking for shunting going across because remember that that is that hole that's there, that PFO, uh, that uh, foramen ovale that's closed is its valve, and that tissue is not fused together. So as we stretch, that's just reopening and pulling those two membranes apart, which then reopens that hole. So you definitely want to look at that. So. From those comments, what do we, what perspectives, what views do we want to see, and what measurements do we want to do to quantify these chamber sizes of the atria? So we do our LA volume and then our right atrium, we do uh, major and minor. Okay. So just to clarify, yes, in our lab, that's what I'm having you do. And the reason we're having you do that is because you need to practice both types of measurement. In most labs nowadays, they will measure a volume on both. So we would actually do that tracing for both just to make that clear. Again, the major minor, I have you do that to practice doing it because some labs still may do the old, old way of measuring, uh, which is the major minor, and they may do that bilaterally on both atria. So just, just keep that in mind that those measurements are simply, I'm having you do different, two different types because I need you to know how to do those for registry. Uh, but normally, yes, you would measure a full volume. Nancy? Uh, to measure the full volume, you, does your machine have to be able to do that? Um, yes and no. Um, you can do volume, there's generic volume tools that you can select if your system didn't do it. Now, if you're on a cardiac system, I'd be super, super surprised nowadays that they didn't have a measurement package for that. So definitely, first things first, always go to the measurement package. If you're on an old uh, HP 5500, for example, um, it didn't have volume calculations for uh, atria, but the trick on that is that you do a tracing around where you're supposed to be from annulus, trace it around to the other annulus. You hit select, that makes an area, and then you do a length measurement from the middle of the annulus uh, the valve to the back of the uh, chamber. Locking that in effectively creates a generic symptom on that system. So you can do it. It's an area length measurement. So you trace the area as you would and you take the length and then it can be calculated for a symptom of biplane. Uh, which do you do that on the same picture? Uh, yeah, you do it on the same picture as you would if you had a volume. Yeah, and, and, you, yeah, Just... and the, the length, yes, you typically would, but you don't necessarily have to. On that system, if you put it together, then it will lock it in that way. I think if you did it in separate images, it would not. Okay, so I'm, I'm just thinking like room three. Okay, so room three is uh, 5,500 there, I think, yeah. So that's how you do it. So you trace it, okay. use that measurement up, um, and then the length, and then, and then after you did the length and lock that in, then it gives you the lines just like a symptom does. That's, that's your uh, method of disk. Oh, that's cool. I can't wait to try that. 
Yeah, and then so if you do it from that plane, remember to do it from the other plane too, like from a two chamber view to give you a more of a, a true volume type of a measurement. Uh, remember, there's a lot of assumptions being made mathematically that uh, assume they're round circles when they're in fact not. Um, <clears throat> okay. So yeah, so we measure those things. We plug those in. We look at those uh, dimensions. Uh, we look at the eighth ratio steps. And so, what uh, what echo views um, show me the atria? Just la label them off for me. Subcostal. Subcostal does yes. Now Damn subcostal should be more of a subjective look at it. Mike, you had a comment. I mean, avicals obviously are great Apical, for it. Definitely. Right ventricular focus for the right atrium. Okay. You can see the left atria dimension in per sternal long axis. Yes, you can, and you should measure it there too. Yes. Uh, in two D and in M mode. Remember that's that's really our first clue on size of the atria. The rest of it we're going to confirm as we start getting the volumes from the atrials. Um, Okay, so long axis, do I see the right atria at all in character in the long axis view? Not unless you go to inflow. Yeah, an inflow. Which we always do, right? Is that part of your protocol? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> gotta get TR. So while we're looking at TR, don't forget that we are also looking at the right atria all the time. Okay, so I know we often neglect that because we look at the tricuspid valve and we're more interested in getting a regurge. But don't forget that we're looking for stenosis, that we're looking for dilated RV, that we're looking for right atrial issues as well. So all that is taken into consideration from that perspective. Uh, what about short axis view? Both of them. Okay, yes. So, so we're looking at um, the peristernal short axis at the base. We're looking at that valvular level at the aorta, uh, pulmonary valve, and the tricuspid valve. Uh, we see both the right and left atria from that perspective. What else do we see that sits between those two chambers? The interatrial septum. And evaluate the interatrial septum for sure. Okay. And secondarily, yes, we're going to be also looking for regurgitation so you can see those from that. So basically, any, any 2D picture of a ventricle and or a uh, atria would be appropriate for uh, restrictive physiology to show the two-dimensional um, perspectives of it. Okay, so real quick, we touched on the amyloid, so it's an infiltrative type of a process. Um, it comes across on echo as a speckled appearance. Um, the pitfalls are gonna be things like harmonics. Uh, harmonics can give a similar appearance on a normal uh, myocardium. Um, if you suspect that it might be just um, the harmonic influence, turn off your harmonics and see it without the harmonics and see if that still appears that way. Um, okay, and then of course, if we uh, when we see those thick walls and that, we're going to do diastolic stuff, you know, the measurements of all the inflows and such, et cetera, uh, to show what's going on. Uh, DTI and strain can show early evidence of it as well. Uh, if if we do have a restrictive filling pattern and we confirm that on our on our inflows, uh, that is a bad prognosis. It's uh, those with restrictive filling issues have some pretty significant diastolic function. So remember that is the uh, the more severe of the diastolic function stages. Scott, yeah, on on the PowerPoint it says turn harmonics off. But in the book, it says that um, that it's useful to scan in both harmonics and fundamental frequency. Yes. So the comment, the reason we say that comment is because if uh, you're scanning with harmonics, which typically we do, because that cleans out a lot of our uh, artifacts and stuff like that from a physics standpoint, um, it's going to come across and a normal heart might look like it has amyloidosis and they're saying that if, uh, if you think it looks like that and you think it's pathologic, you need to turn your harmonics off to be able to determine that it's not the harmonic causing the experience mm -hmm. um, instead of the real thing. So what they're saying, what you're saying is that um, it's suggesting to use both and that is the reason to use both is to confirm that it's not a an artifactual type of an appearance that we're making something look like a pathology when it in fact is not. Does that answer your question? 
Yes, thank you. Hey, Nancy, go ahead. I'm confused about that. Um, I thought, in my mind, I thought harmonics took the speckle away. Uh, well, it's just the appearance of it because of the fluid filled uh, structures and just the way that it comes across. They come across as very bright spots, bright speckles. And that's a diagnostic marker for, um, for amyloidosis. Uh, it tends to get a bright speckling appearance. So if you have a normal heart, for example, and uh, it has kind of some bright speckly stuff, and it's not because we're overgained, um, it might just simply be because. Um, because of the harmonics. It does give some appearances of uh, some bright spots, bright speckles at times. Uh, in fact, when you're looking at things like valves, having harmonics on can make the valves look thicker than they really are, particularly with the older style of harmonics. Uh, even though our detail resolution is better, it gives some artifactual presentations that uh, aren't as, as accurate. So you don't completely want to rely on harmonics all the time. If you think that harmonics is giving an appearance you don't want to see or, or you don't think it's real, uh, then turn it off to see what it looks like without. That's appropriate. Um, and again, with amyloid, this is an infiltrative state. This is a uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy type of a presentation where we have significantly thick walls also. So if I'm looking at a patient with normal sized walls. So this diagram or the, the picture, sorry, in the bottom right here. So you can see bright speckles in that septum, right? And here you can see a thicker array of uh, bright speckles, but this wall uh, is significantly thicker than it is on the normal patient. Okay, so we always, and as you're, as you're looking at your echoes even now, I guarantee that you're gonna see these little bright streaks of stuff inside the heart. Uh, don't assume that it's just amyloidosis. Okay, that's often caused by, or it's at least accentuated by harmonics. But just to give an idea with, uh, there's something called nuchal translucency. So on uh, little tiny, tiny babies, you look at the, uh, the little line of skin and the uh, amount of fluid between the skin and the neck of the baby. And um, when we do that, um, back in the day, they, you weren't allowed to use harmonics because some versions of harmonics would make the pixels bloom and be thicker than it really is. Uh, and they were calling abnormalities all the time when in fact the babies were quite normal. Um, and that's just, that's just a characteristic of harmonics. Even though theoretically our pixel size is tighter and smaller. Okay. And then, so look for the thick walls again. Uh, I think Yusenia commented that uh, you might have a little bit of um, pericardial effusion along with these types of things as well. So the more of that pathologic type stuff you see going on, the more likely you'll have that. And um, I don't think we went too much into these slides on strain imaging, uh, but strain imaging is used uh, for amyloidosis, probably second most common to uh, cancer therapy. So that's one area you might see it fairly widely used. Uh, but they'll be looking more at the color maps of strain and looking for like a, what they call a cherry uh, type of an appearance, which is near the apex on that bullseye view. Okay. So again, the restrictive, I'm just gonna jump ahead to the chart because it's just summarizing what we see in the chart. So in essence, um, we're looking at these two categories at the end, the reversible restricted and the fixed restricted or irreversible. Uh, it could again be called grade three or grade four, sometimes you'll see as 3A, 3B. Uh, those are all restrictive physiology. So from a diastolic perspective, what do you think your first clue is that they might have restrictive cardiomyopathy from a Doppler standpoint or hemodynamic standpoint? Increased E wave. Yes, so the E wave is going to be the, the thing that stands out the most. So you're seeing uh, usually greater than double um, E to A ratio. So if it's over two, um, the, the pseudo normal kind of does look within normal, because remember you got, uh, looking at the pseudo normal, you have the E to A ratio is uh, 0.8 to 1.5 in a pseudo normal, and it's uh, one to one and a half on a normal. So they're pretty similar. Uh, they also have similar D cell times and stuff like that. So on these, you're gonna notice a very high um, 
P wave compared to the A wave, and it's going to be very steep. So my deceleration time is less than 160 milliseconds, but you're going to notice that it's steep as well. Because um, often you're going to see these waveforms, they go up and they got quite a, they got a quite a gradual slope, relatively speaking. Uh, but when it becomes very steep and very tall, then I'm thinking restrictive for sure. So those, those are kind of your, uh, as you're screening these, you're going to notice those stand up quite significantly. And then of course we measure those. And in addition, we're looking at things like le left atrial pressure, um, and they're going to be significantly elevated. Again, the biatrial enlargement is going to come into play with uh, visually what's going on here as well. But in essence, uh, the numbers of the restrictive cardiomyopathy, that's what we're looking at to distinguish it. So if you think you got it, you know, even if you need to go back to your book and say, you know, what, what exactly do I need to measure? Make sure you get the, all the appropriate measurements and all the appropriate comparisons to the, um, to the tissue Doppler, compare it to the, um, pulmonary venous flow, et cetera. Okay, so restrictive is often a global type of a process, so it, it generally affects the heart uh, overall and not just regionally. Uh, and then other disease processes, uh, and this is not uh, totally inclusive with all these, but there, there could be others also, but the more common ones are things like hemochromatosis, um, and glycogen storage, storage disease, which is also called Febreze disease. Um, not like Febreze, the spray. So those are just other processes. There are other ones as well that uh, could come in and uh, cause those types of appearances. And then as I suggested, we have to diagnose and differentiate. So we have constrictive versus restrictive. And so it's going to be important again, I know that we haven't talked much about constrictive yet, um, but start start <clears throat> compartmentalizing this now. And the, the take home message is, is that my in restrictive, I've got biatrial enlargement. So that's suggesting that constrictive does not have biatrial enlargement. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the other big differentiator is the third point there that constrictive has uh, an exaggerated respiratory variation uh, on my E peaks. So we're going to see E peaks going up and down. How do you think I would show a rest, an exaggerated respiratory variation with my E peaks? What should you do on your system to prove that? Change sweep speed. Yes, to what? Really tiny. So we want the waves to be not tiny this way, but tiny like scrunched horizontally, right? So okay. just like the EKG, if we, decrease the sweep speed, what does that do versus increasing the sweep speed? You'll so see if more. I, if, I, if I run the script faster, but it's still writing at the same rate, I'm going to see more. If I increase the speed, it's going to slow, you know, it's going to give fewer waveforms more spread out. If I decrease the sweep speed, which is what we want to do in this case, then we're going to compress. We're going to slowly drag the script across while it's still writing at the same rate. So we see more EA uh, waveforms uh, collectively. And we're looking at the peaks of those and we're going to draw them up and down and that changes with respiration. Um, you could do this on the tricuspid valve, you could do this on the mitral valve. Um, and when we get to tamponade, we're going to do just that. And in tamponade situation, you're going to uh, have an opposite effect. Well, you, you normally have an opposite effect with the right atria versus the left atria, the left flow. Uh, so they work opposite of each other. When one's going up, the other's going down, and they're always um, going that way. Uh, again, we're going to measure the peaks at the, at the highest ones, and we're going to measure the peaks at the lowest ones, and compare those. If it's greater than 25% variation, that gives us constrictive. Uh, if it's less than 25% variation, uh, it's going to be suggesting um, it's probably more likely uh, restrictive physiology. So Again, we're going to want to differentiate between those two things because in, in a lot of ways, they're going to look similar. All right. And then our E prime. Yeah, Nancy, go ahead. It is, is this a thing having a patient hold their breath so they all look the same? Uh, you're not going to have them hold their breath in this. You're going to, you're going to take it with a quiet respiration or just normal respiration. Uh, because you need to see the variation. If we have them hold the breath, it's going to accentuate that. 
So that's like doing a Valsalva maneuver essentially. Uh, if we do that, we're we're augmenting um, what's happening, and it's not it's not giving us true data. You need to see it with a normal resp respiration, so the patient needs to be breathing normally. Right. But would we do it on other diseases? Have them hold their breath. Uh, yeah, I mean, for Valsalva and stuff, if I'm looking for a pseudonormal pattern, for example, even the restrictive, if I'm wanting to see if the E and A reverses or gets suppressed uh, to a certain degree, I'm going to have them hold their breath and bear down. Um, holding their breath a long time is effectively going to do the same thing uh, because your that breath hold is keeping it at that status and it's increasing the right heart pressures uh, and the filling pressures um, is affecting uh, how much goes into the atria. That will affect uh, go through the entire heart so it takes a few beats um, but it will affect both so in this case we don't want to do that maneuver but in other cases yes we would do that maneuver. does that make sense i i guess i'm just confused why um like sometimes in lab we i don't know if anyone else has heard but like we want to get at least three waveforms that look the same. And the way to do that is to have your patient stop breathing. I mean, yeah, I can see that because what I'm suggesting here is that normal respiration does vary your waveform somewhat. Um, and getting those in, part of the problem is, is if you're Dopplering, we often fall out of the waveform because as we breathe, it's moving my window. That's part of it. So holding the breath can stabilize your window for one. Uh, for two, you're getting kind of a, um, an idea what's going on, but uh, there is a natural uh, transition from higher to lower velocities with normal respiration, as long as it's less than 25% variation. So there is some variation. So holding the breath is more to stabilize the window, I think, than anything. Um, having said that, us having them hold their breath does change what's happening even to a minor degree. So there's times that are appropriate to use actual Valsalva, which, which is uh, you know, particularly looking at, um, at pseudonormal pattern from impaired relaxation, which most of our patients are gonna be either impaired or pseudonormal because of the age population we scan. Um, we're not gonna be scanning probably a whole lot of you know, 25 year olds except in lab. Um, so yes, uh, it will affect it to some minor degree and that's negligible for what you're doing on a normal basis. That's okay. But if we're looking for this one, um, we got those high, um, super high E waves compared to the A waves. We got that, you know, shortened, uh, deceleration time, et cetera. You definitely want to see that variation. And when we get yeah, it's a diagnostic time, criteria, so you need to have it. Yes. And so when we get into constrictive and we, we concern about um, tamponade, it's really important that we get, uh, we slow down that sweep speed and we get you know, that respiratory variation. That's gonna be very important. Uh, the E prime velocities uh, on restrictive um, are typically, it says less than 10, but I, like I suggested before, these are actually usually down around like four or five centimeters per second. They're quite low. Uh, the E's and the A's are both very low velocity on restrictive physiology because you think about the movement of the annulus is barely moving at all um, because it's so thickened and so re, you know, restricted. Whereas constricted, you'll have the higher um, E prime velocity. Because in constrictive, it's not usually the heart itself that has the issue. It's the pressure from outside the heart that's affecting the heart. The heart muscle may be totally fine in a constrictive uh, situation. Okay, and this is our last slide then for this, just a few other things to touch on. So there's endocardial uh, fibroelastosis, uh, which is a congenital tropical and there's also non-tropical acquired forms, but what do you think endocardial fibroelastosis is based on the name? Scar tissue. Okay, okay. yeah, it's a fibrous type of a buildup on uh, the endocardial layer. Um, so what do you think you might see with a, um, an echo with this? So we have different tissue types. Kind of tense, so, dick, or dense. Um fibro like 
fiber material? It'll show up as more hyperechoic? Yes, yes, exactly. So when we get these fibrous type of deposits, they tend to be uh, hyperechoic compared to our muscle, which is slightly more hypoechoic. Um, so you'll start to notice a thickened uh, lining around the, the endocardium. And we do want to pay uh, close attention to, to um, the apex area because sometimes that can mimic uh, the appearance of a thrombus. Okay, but then we're looking at wall motion and stuff, and we've got good wall motion and stuff like that. Uh, we're less concerned about thrombus and more about something like this. Um, it's also so associated with hyper eosinophilic syndrome. So that does tend to get a proliferation of that thickening of the apex in particular. Uh, it's an in inflammation of the endocardium. Um, look for thrombus. Uh, late stages of it, it has the appearance of dilated cardiomyopathy with restricted physiology because it is affecting the diastolic function and uh, it's making the entire wall, um, including that endocardial layer, uh, look thicker than it normally is. And then uh, there's selective involvement of the uh, posterior mitral valve leaflet as well with uh, mitral uh, regurgitation. So again, um, when we're getting the stretched out chambers and stuff like that, I would not be surprised to see um, to see that effect in the mitral valve and getting some regurg. And that is the end of those. So take a message on the restrictive is uh, start to build your uh, differentiation between restrictive and, and constrictive because that will become more important as we get into and cover the constrictive. Again, they'll have some similar appearances, but uh, that biatrial enlargement preserved or, or small chamber size with thickened walls and stuff like that. And again, just knowing that uh, with these hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, uh, the bulk of the muscle is what's important uh, to note. And so that's going to be done by measuring in 2D. That's going to be done by uh, possibly doing um, your LV mass index, stuff like that. Um, these are typically, again, in isolation with valvular type of disease. So your valves are normal to maybe slightly thick and slightly abnormal, but not enough to cause these types of things. And when we're talking thickening, we're talking steak size. We're talking Costco steak versus uh, carne asada size. <laughs> not very thin. It's going to be super thick, chunky steak. Okay. Any other questions on? Um, Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Yeah, Nancy. Uh, when are we doing constrictive? Uh, we will do that with uh, pericardial disease. Okay. I believe that's the section it's in. We're going to cover um, pericarditis and stuff like that. Pericardial disease should uh, should be in that section. I just need to know where to place this. Chart and making. Line. Yes. And in that section, they give a chart that compares restrictive and constrictive and uh, the things that, and you'll see a lot of similar things. What we're really interested in is seeing the differentiator. Okay. So we will revisit the concept of uh, by atrial chamber enlargement as well as the PA ratios and the E velocities and stuff like that and the respiratory variation. Good, good. But very quick question. So yeah. if, for example, on a test you ask us in infiltrate or restrictive cardiomyopathy, do we need to have harmonic off or on? <laughs> uh, so where you want to turn it on and off is if you think you have amyloidosis. In amyloidosis. So that's the one that gets the speckly appearance and harmonic mm -hmm. can make it speckly appearance on a normal type. And so to differentiate that, if you turn harmonic off, in a normal heart, that speckly appearance will go away. Uh, whereas if we turn it off and it's a amyloidosis case, it will still be a speckly appearance. Thank you. Yeah, and keep that in mind again, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the harmonics and the effect it can have. When you think that your, your valvular structures are thickened, like truly thickened, uh, it, that's another time that it might be helpful to turn harmonics off to see if it's still as thick as you think it is. Um, I'll just use another example. When I was scanning, um, and as I do scan obstetric cases, 
Um, if a child has um, what they call echogenic bowel, uh, in other words, the, the speckles from the bowel of the baby are as bright as the bone, that's a genetic uh, and that's, that's, a, that's a problematic disease process that is going on. And that's diagnostic of that with a curvilinear transducer typically. And so having, having that appearance can make it look as if something's very abnormal. And so nowadays we often scan with a linear nine type of a transducer, which gives us beautiful detail. But uh, because we've jumped up to significantly higher frequency transducer with harmonics on, it gives that additional speckly appearance, which makes it look like something very abnormal, but we're using a very different uh, transducer frequency range. And uh, because these newer systems are so good, um, we start to see things in more detail than we used to. And so uh, again, for that, we would go back to a curvilinear transducer if we thought that was true. If it's a true diagnosis, it would still be as bright as the bone, but typically if it's not, um, if it's not that disease process, then it would go back to looking like a normal uh, curvilinear picture normally would, even though that linear showed that uh, presentation of it. So harmonics can be uh, a sketchy thing. Another place that they use it in, in ultrasound imaging is breast imaging. So if we're looking at uh, masses and tumors in breasts, um, they often take harmonics off because we're using such a high frequency transducer with harmonics that it gives the appearance of things that are calcified when they're in fact not calcified. So that's just, it's just us knowing the physics of the system. And if you're seeing something that you think is real, turn the harmonics off and see if it still presents itself that way. Okay, if it goes away, that's gonna suggest it's probably not that thing. Nancy's eyeballs are piling that away. <laughs> or thinking about it. <laughs> I was thinking about like, because I can't remember what the answer was, but for in physics, when we were talking about it and a cyst, a diagnostic, you know, or a stone is to have that. Do they stay there or go away with harmonics? I can't remember. So what we were talking about in specific with that is actually compounding because compounding hides those diagnostic markers. So th those are, again, those are diagnostic markers to show. Mm -hmm. So we're using artifacts to show diagnostic markers classically. And uh, some of the newer technology eliminates those so effectively that we lost our diagnostic uh, marker that was, a, that was actually just an artifact. Um, but that took away our way to, that we used to diagnose with. And so turning that on and off does uh, help to distinguish between these things. Because we can miss stuff that, uh, if we're not paying enough attention. I don't know about you. It's a lot of like place to spin. On, I don't <laughs> like missing stuff on patients when they've got real disease processes. I mean, have you ever been to the doctor and uh, you've got a pain or a, you know some type of a complaint and you go there, they do their testing and stuff and then you come away with no answers? Okay, that's frustrating for a patient to not have answers. And, and so we wanna do the best thing that we can as echo techs uh, to prove or disprove uh, definitively those those disease processes because you know it's good to not find these cardiac diseases sometimes but you know if we miss them that's that's bad but you know it's it's peace of mind for the patient when they when they can have an answer even if the answer is you definitely don't have this rather than ah you might still have it I don't know um, the patients want answers and our job is to answer the clinical question as best we can. So just thinking of it again from the patient's perspective, uh, you want answers to what's going on. Okay, that is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hey Scott, I have a few questions. Yeah, uh, go ahead. About the summer class. Sure. Uh, well, one in registering for 